In the dim corridors of a dusty archive within the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, a discovery was made that would perplex scholars for generations. It was the year 1838 when an antiquarian, leafing through the collection of the library, stumbled upon an object that seemed out of place amidst the orderly stacks of documented knowledge. This was the Rohonk Codex, a volume whose origin and meaning were shrouded in obscurity. The Codex itself was unassuming at first glance, its leather binding worn by the touch of time, with evident scuffs and scratches that told of a long history in obscurity. The pages, yellowed by age, had curled slightly at the edges, and a musty scent, the perfume of antiquity, wafted from its pages, filling the air with the aroma of forgotten yesterdays. As the finder's hands reverently opened the cover, he was met not with the familiar Latin script of medieval European texts, but with rows upon rows of peculiar symbols. These symbols danced across the pages in a rhythmic pattern, each one uniquely different from any script known to the scholars of the day. There were over 200 distinct characters, none repeating in the familiar ways of European languages. They seemed to follow a disciplined order, suggesting meaning and structure, yet defied the usual conventions of written language. The codex was substantial in size, containing 448 paper leaves, a considerable amount for any manuscript of its purported age. Each page measured approximately 10 Sauter 12 centimeters, suggesting a design for portability, perhaps as a personal reference or a prayer book. However, the content was anything but devotional or educational in any conventional sense. Accompanying the mysterious script were illustrations, 87 in total, meticulously drawn and depicting an eclectic range of scenes. Some depicted battles, with warriors dressed in various armors, wielding swords and bows, their faces set in expressions of grim determination or exultant triumph. Others showed gatherings of people, perhaps in worship, with hands raised towards figures that might be divine, their visages marked by both benevolence and severity. These drawings were a juxtaposition of simplicity and complexity. The human figures were rendered with a naive straightforwardness, yet the scenes were composed with an attention to detail that suggested a rich narrative. Every image seemed to be a window into a world that was at once profoundly familiar and disconcertingly alien. The Codex's language of pictures extended to the margins, where small, intricate drawings often took root. These marginalia sometimes seemed to comment on the main illustrations, providing ancillary details or possibly even contradicting the larger scenes, further deepening the enigma. Initial examination of the Codex raised more questions than answers. Was it a document of religious significance, a compendium of myth, or a historical record of a lost civilization? The finder, aware of the potential significance of his discovery, handled the tome with a mix of awe and trepidation. He knew that the Codex held secrets that would tantalize and challenge the intellectual curiosity of many who, like him, were captivated by the unknown. The Rohonk Codex was thus christened, named after the town of Rohonk, now Rechnitz, Austria, where it was purportedly found. Its discovery set off a wave of scholarly excitement, as it promised the allure of an academic treasure hunt. The race to unravel the mysteries bound within its pages had begun, a scholarly odyssey that would span centuries without promise of resolution. From its first emergence into the light of modern study, the Rohonk Codex was an enigma, a tantalizing puzzle from the past that beckoned the brave and curious to unlock its secrets. Yet, for all the eager minds that would come to grapple with its mysteries, the Codex would remain an inscrutable relic of a time and place that refused to be understood, a defiant whisper from history that challenged the present to listen and comprehend. Upon its introduction to the scholarly world, the Rohonk Codex asserted itself as an enigma of unprecedented proportions. The heart of its mystery lay in the strange script that sprawled across its pages. This script was not merely unknown, it was alien to the very concept of written language as understood in the 19th century. 
The symbols within the codex were as varied as they were numerous. No alphabet in recorded history contained such a multitude of characters. Some estimates put the count at around 800 unique signs, though about 200-400 seemed to repeat with varying frequency. The characters were diverse in form. Some bore a slight resemblance to known alphabets with their curves and lines, while others were dots and dashes that could easily be mistaken for a form of shorthand or a primitive binary code. Curiously, the script did not conform to the right-to-left or left-to-right orientations familiar to European scholars. Instead, it appeared to be written in Baustrophodon style, where the direction of writing alternates with each line, a manner seen in various ancient scripts, but with irregularities that puzzled those who noticed the pattern. The task of deciphering these characters was monumental. Early attempts approached the text with the presumption that it was a cipher, a code that could be cracked by finding the right key. Cryptanalysts pored over the text, counting the frequency of each symbol, looking for patterns that might suggest a substitution method where each symbol represented a particular letter from a known language. However, the symbols defied such simple categorization, appearing to follow no pattern that matched known linguistic structures or cryptographic systems. Some characters appeared isolated, like islands of meaning unto themselves, while others seem bound to their neighbors, suggesting an interdependence that hinted at a syllabary or logographic system where characters might represent sounds or entire words. Yet, the distribution of these symbols did not match any known phonetic or semantic systems. The text seemed consistent within itself, with definite recurring patterns and structures, implying it was not random gibberish but a form of complex communication. The presence of diacritical marks, dots, and dashes, above and below the primary symbols, complicated matters further. In some languages, such marks are used to denote vowel sounds or to alter consonant values. Yet, their application in the Rohan Codex was erratic and seemed to follow no discernible rules related to the modification of sounds or meaning. The cryptic script of the Rohan Codex tantalized linguists and codebreakers alike with its intricacies. Scholars developed databases of the characters, painstakingly recording their every occurrence and context, hoping to discern patterns or repetitions that might yield a clue to their meaning. Digital analysis and computer algorithms, which were far beyond the capabilities of the Codex's initial examiners, eventually came to be applied to this linguistic labyrinth searching for statistical anomalies and structural regularities. Yet, despite these efforts, the script remained resistant to interpretation. Each attempted translation confronted the scholar with a linguistic paradox, a text that seemed coherent and systematic, yet refused to align with any known language or cipher. The characters of the Rohan Codex were a testament to the complexity of human communication and the possibility of a language that existed outside the scope of documented history, a language that, if deciphered, might reveal a narrative as profound as it was enigmatic. As the scholars of the day grappled with the Rohan Codex's enigmatic script, they turned their attention to the visual narratives that adorned its pages in the hope that they might offer a more immediate avenue to understanding. The illustrations, upon closer scrutiny, were as confounding as the text they accompanied, if not more so, due to their intricate details and the stories they seemed desperate to convey. The Codex was a pictorial odyssey, a journey through images that, in their own right, comprised a tapestry of tales and esoteric knowledge. Each illustration was bordered with meticulous care, as though framing a world within a world, and often, they seemed to correspond to the mysterious script that flowed alongside them. The illustrations were rendered in what appeared to be ink, now faded to a soft sepia tone, giving the figures and scenes a ghostly and timeless appearance. The illustrations could be divided into several thematic categories. The first consisted of religious iconography, dense with symbolism that straddled the familiar and the arcane. There were scenes that one might associate with Christian imagery, figures resembling Christ, Mary, 
and various saints, alongside others that seem to draw on pagan or even Eastern orthodoxies. For instance, one page depicted a crucifixion, yet the setting was unfamiliar, lacking the usual biblical context, and was instead surrounded by a series of smaller images, whose relation to the central event was unclear. Another category presented sequences of military engagements. Armored knights clashed with a determined enemy, their armor evoking no singular time or place, but rather an amalgamation of styles spanning from the Byzantine to the medieval European. Archers released volleys of arrows beneath banners whose crests resisted identification. Siege engines, resembling neither the classical designs of Rome nor the later inventions of the Middle Ages, assaulted fortress walls that seemed impossibly tall and sturdy. A third category might be termed ritualistic. These images depicted groups of figures engaged in activities that suggested ceremonies or religious rites. Individuals were shown being baptized, others knelt in what might be prayer, before altars topped with objects unrecognizable in any known religious practice. In some scenes, figures processed in long lines, carrying staffs or icons that bore cryptic symbols, perhaps in pilgrimage or celebration. The figures within these scenes were diverse, their attire spanning a broad spectrum of cultures and epochs. In some illustrations, the clothing was suggestive of the Far East, in others, distinctly European, and in still others, utterly fantastical, as if the artist drew from a dream or vision rather than reality. Facial expressions were captured with a poignant intensity, eyes wide in fervor or solemnity, mouths open in what could be song, supplication, or agony. What was most striking about these illustrations was their sense of narrative progression. The images often followed a logical sequence, like a storyboard for an unwritten epic. The progression seemed to suggest a storyline or mythos that could potentially align with the script, if only one could be understood in the context of the other. Some scholars posited that the illustrations were the key to deciphering the text, visual cues that could unlock the language if interpreted correctly. Attempts to categorize the imagery based on known art historical periods were frustrated by anachronistic elements. Certain battle scenes, for example, featured weaponry and tactics from different eras in close juxtaposition. Scholars speculated that the Codex might document a conflated history, a synthesis of events and myths from disparate sources, or perhaps the illustrator was constrained only by the limits of imagination, not historical accuracy. The artistic style of the illustrations was another puzzle. The line work ranged from simplistic and almost childlike in its execution to pages where the detail was fine and deliberate, suggesting a well-practiced hand. Was this the work of multiple artists, or one whose style evolved or varied according to the subject matter? Ultimately, the illustrations of the Rohan Codex presented a visual enigma as layered and complex as the cryptic script they accompanied. They beckoned viewers into a world of the Codex's creator's making, a world that straddled the realms of the divine, the historic, and the mythological. Each image was a piece of a narrative mosaic, waiting for the one who could piece them together and reveal the stories they were so eager to tell. As the Rohan Codex sat in the hands of puzzled experts, its origins remained as inscrutable as its content. The provenance of the manuscript was a critical piece of the puzzle that could potentially shed light on the cryptic text and images. Without a clear lineage, the Codex was an orphan of history, its past as much a mystery as its meaning. The investigation into the Codex's background began with its first recorded owner, Count Gustav Batiani, a Hungarian nobleman with a penchant for collecting books and manuscripts. It was under his auspices that the Codex was placed in the library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in 1838, and thus entered the annals of public record. However, the trail of ownership, and consequently, the story of its origins, grew cold beyond the Count's eclectic collection. Count Bathiani's library was extensive, and records were not meticulously kept regarding the acquisition of each piece, 
leaving scholars to speculate. There was no clear indication of where the Count had obtained the Codex, or from whom. The Count himself had passed away, leaving no notes or letters that might divulge the Codex's history. It was as if the manuscript had materialized out of thin air into his collection, a treasure chest with no key. To deepen the historical roots of the Codex, researchers pored over the Count's correspondences, the acquisition logs of his library, and any transactions that could provide a breadcrumb trail. They interviewed individuals who had been associated with the Count's estate, hoping for recollections or records that had escaped formal documentation. Yet, all these efforts yielded little more than vague allusions to old manuscripts and rare finds, nothing that spoke of the Rohonk Codex directly. One theory suggested that the Codex may have been brought from India, as the Count had in his possession several Eastern artifacts. However, the language and imagery did not align well with any known South Asian scripts or iconography. Another hypothesis proposed that it had been unearthed in the ruins of a medieval European castle, perhaps hidden away during a time of conflict or persecution. But again, there was no concrete evidence to support this, only romantic conjecture. The material analysis of the Codex offered a sliver of insight into its age. The paper and ink underwent a series of tests, including radiocarbon dating, which suggested that the manuscript was created sometime in the 16th or 17th century. However, even this information was received with caution, as the testing process had its limitations and margins of error. Watermarks on the paper provided another tantalizing clue. They resembled those known to be used in the Venetian Republic in the 1500s, implying a possible connection to Italy, or at least to the trade routes that Venice was central to during the Renaissance. Scholars debated the implications of this find. Was the Codex the product of an Italian scribe, or had the paper simply made its way eastward to be used by an unknown author in a different land? Forensic linguists and historians attempted to correlate the script and illustrations with known cultures and languages of the proposed era, scanning records for any mention of similar artifacts. They delved into the murky waters of lost languages, secret societies, and heretical texts, searching for parallels in the esoteric and often clandestine literature of the time. The origins of the Rohan Codex remained veiled in history's shadow, its creator and purpose obscured by the mists of time. Each new hypothesis seemed only to deepen the mystery, leading to a labyrinth of speculation and scholarly intrigue. The Codex was not just a riddle written in an unknown script, it was an artifact devoid of context, a puzzle box lacking any apparent keyhole, and its origins were the first, most elusive piece that scholars desperately sought to find. In the absence of concrete evidence regarding the origins of the Rohan Codex, researchers embarked on a quest to place the manuscript within the context of cultural history. The manuscript, with its peculiar script and confounding illustrations, seemed to be an amalgam of influences, potentially bridging diverse traditions and eras. This chapter in the Codex's story involves the scholarly effort to unravel the threads of culture woven into the fabric of the manuscript. Eager to map the Codex's place in history, researchers first sought to compare its illustrations with known art movements and historical events. The varied styles of armor and weaponry suggested a wide range of epics, from the Dark Ages to the Late Renaissance while the religious iconography simultaneously echoed the Eastern Orthodox Church, Western Christianity, and even pagan imagery. There were figures with halos, akin to Christian saints, but there were also scenes reminiscent of pagan rituals and Eastern mysticism. These paradoxical elements gave rise to several theories. One proposed that the Codex might be a palimpsest of sorts, a composite of multiple texts that had been compiled and altered over time. Could it be that the Codex was a historical scrapbook, its pages once disparate documents that were later bound together? Yet, this theory struggled against the uniformity of the paper and ink, which suggested a single period of creation rather than a collection of fragments. Another theory explored the possibility 
that the Codex was the creation of a syncretic religious group, one that had merged aspects of various faiths and cultures into a cohesive belief system. The diversity in ceremonial depictions led some to imagine a secretive sect, perhaps one at the margins of medieval Christian orthodoxy, who sought to encode their practices in this manuscript. Scholars also pondered the implications of the military scenes. Some illustrations depicted sieges and battles that did not correspond to any recorded historical conflicts, featuring mixed martial elements drawn from different cultures and time periods. This led to the suggestion that the creator or creators of the Codex might have had access to a broad array of source materials, possibly as travelers or traders who encountered various customs and styles, which they later integrated into the manuscript. The linguistic experts faced an equally challenging landscape. The script did not fit cleanly into any known language family. It seemed to be an isolated phenomenon, a linguistic island. However, linguistic isolation is rare and often tied to geographic remoteness, something that seemed unlikely given the manuscript's apparent historical context. Scholars compared the script to undeciphered languages such as Linear A, from ancient Crete, and to scripts from the Indus Valley civilization, but the connections were tenuous at best. The more esoteric interpretations even delved into the realm of the occult, suggesting that the Codex could be a book of magical or alchemical knowledge, filled with symbolic representations rather than any literal history or scripture. The mix of religious and possibly astrological symbols fueled this line of thought though it did little to satisfy the more scientifically inclined. In each hypothesis, the scholarly community confronted the central issue of synthesis versus singularity. Was the Rohan Codex a cultural mosaic or a singular work representative of an unknown yet self-contained tradition? This debate formed the crux of the research during this period, with scholars entrenched in their respective camps, drawing on historical, religious, and artistic evidence to support their claims. Despite the exhaustive investigation into cultural context and historical parallels, the tapestry of the Rohan Codex remained an intricate weave of incongruities. It was as if the manuscript was a mirror reflecting a distorted vision of history, a collage of cultural motifs that refused to form a coherent picture. Each thread of cultural reference added depth to the mystery. But the full pattern of the Codex's origin and purpose continued to elude clear understanding. The sixth chapter of the Rohunk Codex's tale unfolds in the dimly lit studies of cryptographers and codebreakers, where the manuscript is no longer seen as a historical or cultural relic, but as a cipher waiting to be cracked. The script's resistance to interpretation only served to whet the appetites of those skilled in the art of decipherment drawing in experts from the shadows of wartime espionage and the quiet corners of academia. At the heart of this pursuit was the script itself, an arrangement of symbols that bore no resemblance to any known alphabet, nor did it succumb to the familiar patterns of existing languages. The cryptographer's approach to the codex was methodical, beginning with the basic principles of pattern recognition and frequency analysis. The tools of their trade that had proven effective in breaking many coded messages throughout history. Frequency analysis typically identifies common letters and sequences in a language, providing a statistical entry point into understanding the system of the code. However, the Rohan Codex confounded these efforts. The symbol's frequency did not match those of natural languages, where certain letters appear more commonly than others. Some speculated that the text could be an example of a perfect cipher, one in which each character occurs with equal frequency, rendering traditional frequency analysis moot. Others approached the codex from the angle of steganography, the art of hiding information in plain sight. Was it possible that the real message of the codex was concealed within what appeared to be innocuous text? The illustrations, too, were examined under this lens with experts poring over each detail for hidden indicators or steganographic tells that might point to a concealed meaning. The cryptographers also considered the possibility of a null cipher, 
where much of the text is meaningless, included only to mask the true message hidden within specific symbols or patterns. They searched for acrostics, diagonal readings, and other complex forms of null ciphers that might have been used by the author to veil the true content. The enigma deepened as codebreakers delved into more esoteric forms of cryptography, including transposition ciphers, where the order of symbols is scrambled according to a specific system, and substitution ciphers, where symbols replace the letters of the alphabet one for one or in groups. Yet, none of the traditional methods used in these ciphers aligned with the baffling script of the codex. The potential use of a visionaire cipher, a more sophisticated method of encryption that uses a keyword to dictate the letter substitution, was also explored. This would require a key for decipherment, a word or phrase that might be hidden within the codex itself or lost to history. Cryptanalysts attempted to apply various words as keys, drawing from religious texts, historical figures, and geographic names that might be relevant, but to no avail. The diversity of symbols, some resembling natural forms, others purely abstract, suggested to some that the text might be a complex amalgam of different types of codes, perhaps layering multiple methods of encryption or using a polyalphabetic cipher, which employs multiple alphabets for substitution. If the manuscript were such a cryptographic chimera, it would present a puzzle of monumental difficulty. Despite the onslaught of cryptographic expertise, the script remained unyielding, a silent sentinel guarding its secrets with impeccable integrity. The cryptographers documented their methodologies, shared theories, and engaged in fervent debates about the nature of the code. But as each theory dissipated like mist against a relentless sun, the Codex's script endured, untranslated, unbroken, and as impenetrable as it had been upon its discovery. As the chapter closed, the cryptographers found themselves at a crossroads. Some began to question the authenticity of the manuscript, suggesting it might be an elaborate hoax, a pastiche designed to fool the beholder. Others remained undeterred, convinced that the codex held a genuine message, encoded with a brilliance that time had yet to unravel. The quest for decipherment, replete with failures and frustrations, thus became an intellectual saga drawing the curious and the brilliant into its orbit with the gravity of an unsolved riddle. The saga of the Rohank Codex entered a new era with the advent of digital technology, and Chapter 7 chronicles the efforts of modern-day codebreakers armed with the latest in computational linguistics and pattern recognition software. These enthusiasts, not content with the traditional methods that had yielded little, turned to the burgeoning power of the computer, hoping that algorithms could succeed where human intuition had stalled. The first step in this digital foray was the meticulous digitization of the codex's symbols, a laborious process of transforming each handwritten mark into a pixelated counterpart. This allowed for the application of computational analysis, which could process the vast amounts of data at speeds incomprehensible to human codebreakers. Each character was encoded into a database, tagged and tracked across the codex's pages, mapping the frequency and distribution of symbols in ways previously impossible. Pattern recognition algorithms were unleashed upon these digital symbols, seeking statistical anomalies and correlations that might hint at underlying structures. These sophisticated programs could identify potential patterns and sequences that had eluded human eyes, testing thousands of hypotheses in the blink of an eye. They sifted through permutations of symbol groupings, exploring the possibility of complex code structures that might underpin the text. Neural networks, trained on known languages, attempted to learn the structure of the unknown script looking for latent semantics in the string of symbols. This machine learning approach was akin to teaching a child a new language through exposure, allowing the neural network to develop its own internal representation of the script's logic. Yet, even these advanced systems struggled, stymied by the codex's resistance to revealing any form of predictable grammar or syntax. 
one promising avenue emerged from the field of image analysis. Computer vision techniques were applied to the codex's illustrations, analyzing the visual elements for clues that might correlate with the mysterious text. Digital enhancement revealed details that were not immediately visible to the naked eye. Subtle lines, variations in ink density, and patterns that seemed to echo the rhythms of the text. Could there be a hidden connection between image and script? A sort of steganographic key embedded within the artwork? The Codebreakers also explored the realm of cryptanalysis software, which could rapidly test various cipher keys and decode strategies, applying brute force to the problem in a way that was impractical for human counterparts. The software cycled through classical ciphers, mono, and polyalphabetic substitutions, transpositions, and even attempted to parse the script as if it were an encoded version of a known language. Despite these technological advances, the cryptographers encountered the same frustrating barriers. The codex did not yield to brute force attacks, nor did it succumb to the pattern-finding prowess of artificial intelligence. Each new approach, each algorithmic test, seemed only to deepen the enigma. The software could identify what was statistically improbable or divergent, but it could not imbue these findings with meaning. The absence of a known comparable language made the task of decoding the codex akin to searching for a hidden door in a smooth wall with no seams. The chapter ends on a reflective note, contemplating the implications of the digital stalemate. Was the Rohan Codex genuinely an encoded text, or was its inscrutability a function of its authenticity as an elaborate hoax? The computational efforts, despite their sophistication, had to contend with the possibility that the Codex was a linguistic outlier, a text without kin or key. The efforts of modern cryptographers had not been in vain, however, for they had expanded the boundaries of cryptanalysis and computational linguistics, forging tools and techniques that could one day crack other codes, if not the Rohonk Codex itself. As computational efforts failed to unlock the secrets of the Rohan Codex, the quest for understanding shifted back to more traditional scholarly methods. Chapter 8 examines the myriad of origin theories proposed by linguists, historians, conspiracy theorists, and even amateur sleuths, each contributing to a tapestry of speculation and scholarly debate. The initial forays into the Codex's provenance were driven by linguistic comparisons, Scholars pored over the text, attempting to align its characters with known alphabets. Theories ranged from it being a cipher of an Indo-European tongue, a lost Uralic language, or even a script from the depths of Asia. None, however, could provide a satisfying correlation, leading to a proliferation of more imaginative and sometimes controversial theories. One such hypothesis suggested the Codex was the work of a secret society perhaps the Knights Templar, or the Cathars, who, facing persecution, might have encoded their sacred texts in a script only they could decipher. The esoteric symbols in the illustrations lent some credence to this idea, as they resonated with the iconography associated with secret rites and hidden knowledge. However, evidence of direct links between such groups and the Codex was circumstantial at best. Another school of thought proposed that the Codex could be a product of a syncretic religious community, one that had absorbed elements from Christian, Islamic, and pagan traditions. This theory was bolstered by the variety of religious motifs within the illustrations, which seemed to suggest a blending of spiritual symbols. Perhaps the Codex was a liturgical book for a community whose practices and beliefs were outside the mainstream, created to preserve a unique cultural identity. A more radical theory posited that the Codex was a linguistic experiment, possibly the creation of a polyglot scholar intrigued by the idea of a universal language. This theory drew parallels with other known attempts at creating linguistic systems that could transcend cultural boundaries, such as the philosophical language of John Wilkins or the lingua ignota of Hildegard von Bingen. Some even speculated about extraterritorial origins fueling theories that the Codex was a document left by an ancient astronaut, the script being a form of alien communication. 
While such ideas were widely dismissed by the academic community, they captured the imagination of the public and underscored the enigmatic allure of the Codex. The illustrations did not escape scrutiny. Art historians attempted to date the Codex by stylistic analysis of the drawings, comparing them with known works from various periods and regions. Some illustrations bore a striking resemblance to the Byzantine art style, while others seemed to have been influenced by the Ottoman Empire's miniature paintings. However, the eclectic nature of the images made it difficult to place the Codex within a specific time frame or cultural context. Genealogical researchers contributed to the debate by tracing the ownership and possible lineage of the Codex. The goal was to uncover a trail that might lead back to the Codex's creators. Despite extensive work, genealogical links provided little more than a list of potential suspects, with no definitive evidence to point to one creator or source. Each theory brought its proponents and critics, sparking intense scholarly debate and occasionally spilling into public discourse. The Codex had become not just a puzzle to be solved, but a catalyst for broader discussions about the nature of language, the intersection of culture and spirituality, and the human penchant for mystery. The chapter concludes by acknowledging that the true origins of the Rohonk Codex might lie at the confluence of several theories. Perhaps it was not the singular vision of one individual or group, but a conglomeration of influences and intentions that gave birth to this perplexing manuscript. The origins of the Codex remained veiled, a palimpsest of historical traces and speculative thought, inviting, yet eluding, definitive explanation. Chapter 9 delves into the broader implications of the Rohonk Codex beyond the academic and cryptographic circles, exploring its impact on culture, literature, and the collective imagination of societies fascinated by its enduring enigma. As word of the Codex's mysteries spread beyond the quiet halls of research libraries and into the public domain, it began to acquire a mythic status. The inscrutable script and the allure of an undeciphered message spoke to the universal human love for puzzles and the unknown. This enigma appealed not just to scholars and cryptanalysts, but also to artists, writers, and conspiracy theorists who drew inspiration from its silent symbols. The Codex became a muse to the literary world, featuring in novels and stories where it was often cast as a key to unlocking ancient wisdom or as a harbinger of esoteric truths. It found its way into the plots of mystery and adventure genres, where protagonists would grapple with the cryptic pages in search of treasure, knowledge, or power. Through these fictional narratives, the Codex transcended its physical form to become a symbol of the unattainable, the unknowable, and the sacred. In the realm of popular culture, the Codex influenced a range of media, from television documentaries to online forums where communities formed around the shared quest of cracking its code. It sparked debates on historical revisionism and provided fodder for alternative history enthusiasts who speculated on hidden histories and lost civilizations. The manuscript also became a point of cultural pride and identity, particularly in Hungary, where it was often discussed in the context of national heritage. Despite the uncertain origin of the Codex, its association with the Hungarian town of Rohonk made it a subject of national interest. It featured in exhibitions, and scholars debated its significance in understanding the region's past. In academic circles, the Codex prompted interdisciplinary dialogue across fields such as semiotics, the study of signs and symbols, and the philosophy of language. It raised questions about the nature of meaning-making and communication, providing a real-world artifact for theoretical discussions about the limits of language and the possibility of a truly universal script. Art historians and anthropologists also grappled with the cultural implications of the Codex. The diverse array of religious and cultural symbols within its pages offered a unique, albeit puzzling, window into the cross-cultural exchanges that might have occurred at the time of its creation. The Codex was not just a manuscript, but a canvas that possibly reflected the intermingling of different traditions and beliefs. Moreover, 
The Codex became a subject of study in the psychology of perception and belief. The fervor with which some pursued esoteric explanations for the Codex's origin, despite a lack of empirical evidence, provided insights into how myths and legends can shape our interpretation of historical artifacts. It also demonstrated the cognitive biases at play when individuals are presented with ambigu stimuli, how easily the mind can be swayed by the desire to find patterns and meanings, even where none may exist. The chapter concludes by contemplating the paradox of the Rohonk Codex's legacy. As an object of fascination and study, it has enriched the cultural landscape in ways its creator, whether hoaxer, genius, or mere scribe, could never have anticipated. The Codex's true significance may lie not in the content it conceals, but in the conversations it has sparked, the imagination it has fueled, and the community it has created around the enduring allure of the unknown. Its greatest message, perhaps, is one that transcends language. The reminder that mystery itself can be a profound source of inspiration and wonder. The final chapter of our exploration into the Rohonk Codex contemplates the path forward, looking at the intersection of emerging technologies, the enduring quest for understanding, and the philosophical implications of the manuscript's mystery. The dawn of quantum computing and advances in artificial intelligence hold promise for new attempts at deciphering the Codex. The potential of quantum algorithms lies in their ability to perform complex calculations at unprecedented speeds, possibly identifying patterns and cryptographic keys that are currently beyond our grasp. AI, evolving in its capability to understand and translate languages, could one day crack the code through deep learning models that surpass the pattern recognition abilities of any human or existing computer program. Researchers are cautiously optimistic that these technologies could bring us closer to a breakthrough. There is also the burgeoning field of digital humanities, which marries the rigors of traditional scholarship with the analytical prowess of modern computing. By creating more sophisticated models of the Codex's script and iconography, and by cross-referencing these against a growing database of ancient texts and artworks, digital humanists could uncover new connections that have hitherto remained elusive. In parallel with technological advancements, the chapter discusses how the mystery of the Codex touches upon deeper philosophical questions. It asks us to consider the nature of knowledge. What does it mean to understand a text? Is comprehension merely the translation of symbols into a familiar language, or does it require a deeper cultural and historical context? The Codex challenges us to think about the limits of interpretation and the role that mystery plays in the human experience. Furthermore, the Codex invites reflection on the purpose of communication. In a world where information is often conveyed with efficiency and clarity as the highest virtues, the Codex is a stark contrast, a text that resists easy consumption, that cannot be skimmed, tweeted, or reduced to a soundbite. It serves as a reminder of the times when information was precious, and understanding came through slow and deliberate contemplation. As the chapter moves towards its conclusion, it addresses the ethical considerations of solving the Codex. What responsibility do we have to preserve the mystery as part of our cultural heritage? For some, the Codex has become a symbol of the unknown that should be preserved as a challenge to future generations. For others, the potential historical insights locked within its pages are too valuable to be left undiscovered. This tension between knowing and not knowing is emblematic of our relationship with the past and the unknown. The chapter ends on a note of hopeful speculation. Each attempt to decode the Rohonk Codex, whether failed or promising, adds another layer to its legend. As new tools are developed and fresh eyes examine its pages, the possibility of revelation remains alive. The Codex continues to be a touchstone for collective curiosity, a puzzle that invites each successive generation to the intellectual chase. Regardless of whether the Rohonk Codex is ever deciphered, its true power may lie in its ability to incite wonder, to rally minds towards a common enigma, 
and to endure as a testament to the inexhaustible human desire to explore the unknown. It stands as an enigmatic monument to the past and a beacon for the future, a mystery that continues to unfold with the passage of time. Thank you everyone for watching this wonderful video. If you did enjoy, once again, please make sure to hit the like button. Let me know in the comment section how you did enjoy the story and I will see you in the next mystery video. Peace.